Today on the BRS160, we're going to change the world of lighting. Hi guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. This week we're going to start five weeks of lighting. Reef tank lighting technology has seen some major changes in the last decade. The team here at BRS has been through all of the lighting waves from VHO and PC bulbs, halides, all the way to where we are now with most reefers buying LED options. We've seen all the types of successes you can have with each lighting option, experienced the challenges, found solutions for basically every lighting technology out there. I think we have a tremendous amount of information to share in the next month. We're going to start by defining what exactly it is we're trying to achieve, define some actual goals for lighting the reef tank, and then share some legit criteria that ensures the lighting option you select, install solutions, and lighting settings meet these goals. Almost everything you hear in the reef tank lighting technology world today is related to new color LEDs, different brands of LEDs, near UV light sources, CRI, bins, wattages, form factor changes, optics, denser arrays, energy efficiency, heat sinks, programming software, controller compatibility, modular versus fixtures, all kinds of stuff. Somehow the focus has really shifted from the real purpose of lighting, which is all about creating an ecosystem corals thrive in, into something more about technology, which is largely theory-based. I think it's time to circle back around and refocus our efforts on building that thriving ecosystem. End of the day, what we're really trying to do is emulate a natural reef environment to the best of our ability. In relation to lighting, that's important because corals are highly dependent on light to feed the symbiotic algae within their tissues known as zooxanthellae. In that symbiotic relationship, the zooxanthellae in turn creates nutrition for the corals to survive. So what we really need to be talking about is creating the ideal environment for the corals and their zooxanthellae, which starts with emulating the intensity, spectrums, and types of light they receive in their natural environment the world's coral reefs. There are four main types of light corals receive in nature's oceans. The most obvious is direct sunlight. This is the most intense form of light corals receive and what most people think of when they're considering lighting options. The thing about direct sunlight is it's highly directional. The intensity is extremely dependent on the position in the sky, the angle that it hits the coral, and its directional nature means it's easily shaded by surrounding corals, its own branches, and extended weather patterns. If direct sunlight was suddenly the only type of light available to the world's reefs and the sky itself turns starry black, the directional nature of direct sunlight would likely result in a pretty high mortality rate as the corals in densely populated reefs are caught in each other's or their own shadows. Eventually the corals in their symbiotic zooxanthellae would likely evolve to their new environment, but it typically takes many, many generations for a species to evolve like that. Since the corals in our tanks didn't come from a world where direct sunlight is the only source of light, that shouldn't be our only consideration either. This is where diffuse skylight comes in. You might not think of the sky as an actual source of light, but think of a sunny day where a cloud covers the sun for a moment. How much dimmer does your environment really seem? Even better, a time where you were snorkeling or diving in a cloud covered the sun. It's very possible you didn't even notice a visual change in intensity underwater. That's because the sky does such an awesome job of providing fairly intense, highly diffused light. Diffuse skylight is produced when light from the sun reaches the Earth's atmosphere and is scattered in all directions by the gases, molecules, and particles in the atmosphere. And that effect is the entire sky lights up a bright blue color. If you can, try and imagine what the day would be like if the atmosphere didn't light up like this and the entire sky was starry black. The world would be a much darker place. In fact, on an overcast day, almost none of the light you see is direct sunlight. Almost all of it is diffuse skylight. It's this highly diffused light that reaches the reef from a wide variety of angles that prevents the corals from shading each other and themselves and provides a stable, even source of nutrition for the coral zooxanthellae. Diffused skylight is the reason why the current evolution of coral species in the world's reefs are packed with high density corals that can grow abundantly near each other without concerns about shading each other. If we want a tank that emulates the reef environment full of large, densely packed corals, we have to consider how we're going to emulate some form of that diffused light in the aquarium similar to skylight. Without that, we shouldn't be surprised to see small colonies thrive and then continually die off when they get large enough to shadow their innermost layers or other nearby corals. 
In close relation to that, coral reefs also receive light from reflection off bright substances like sand, commonly referred to as upwelling light. This type of light is what illuminates the bottom of coral colonies and keeps the zooxanthellae healthy and prevents tissue recession. A solid lighting strategy for the reef aquarium will absolutely take upwelling light into consideration. The last major form of light that reaches the coral reefs is commonly referred to as shimmer or glitter lines. This is direct sunlight hitting the surface ripples in the water which greatly magnifies the intensity and creates a strobe effect. We can only theorize what effect the short but rapid intense beams of light have on the corals and their symbiotic algae, but it's absolutely a component of the natural reef environment. Combined together, all of these elements make up most of the light received by corals. After that, duration, spectrum, and intensity are the biggest issues, which not only change throughout the day, but also seasonally and highly dependent on weather patterns. Most reefers believe a gradual change in intensity throughout the day from changes in the position of the sun, intensity in the sky, and clouds is an important component of providing high intensity light corals need combined with breaks they can use to rid themselves of free oxygen radicals and prevent bleaching events. Color spectrum is a strange element because it's a balance between trying to match a coral reef, what the zooxanthellae require for biological function, and producing something where the colors really pop in the aquarium. There's a known photosynthetic spectrum range with a measurement referred to as PER, and tools within the hobby like the Senai, which allows you to monitor and measure PER. Okay, now that we have a solid understanding of the types of light available to the ocean's reefs, we're better equipped to refocus the conversation away from which piece of technology should I buy to what are my goals for lighting the reef tank and how can I use technology to achieve these goals within my individual budget, space, and time constraints. End of the day, the light needs to achieve three goals. First, and obviously the most important, it needs to provide adequate life support to the ecosystem in our reef tanks. Second, the reef tank is likely the single most expensive thing in most of our homes, so it has to look nice. That means it needs to provide a color and lighting effect inside the tank, which is visually appealing. But beyond that, for many of us, this thing's in our living rooms, and we need the lighting module or fixture itself to be attractive as well. In general, the tank, stand, and equipment like lighting that can be viewed externally needs to match the quality of the other furniture and decorations in the room. Third, it has to match whatever the available budget is for these goals. Most of us can't afford the best, most state-of-the-art and attractive solution, so we need to meld these three goals to select something realistic for our own tanks. So how are you supposed to select the right option from the sea of technologies out there? It's easier than it seems. In this series, we're going to help you refine the process into something manageable by dividing these three goals into their most important individual elements, starting with providing adequate life support to the ecosystem in our reef tanks. We're going to dive deep into the individual light sources in the upcoming weeks and how this relates to all of them, but in general, you need to get beyond the marketing hype and brand loyalty to find the best options. In most cases, each individual light source struggles with one major element and a mix of technology often produces the best results. One of the best methodologies is to identify a few solutions you think are going to work inside your budget range and go through the effort to rate them from 1 to 10 on a few elements, starting with the lighting solution's ability to support life. That means 1 to 10 on the lighting solution's ability to provide strong directional source of light and meet the PAR or PER needs of the tank, 1 to 10 on the ability to provide adequate diffuse light as well as spectrum options. If you haven't caught on already, I think the diffuse component and possibly spectrum are a couple of the most commonly overlooked components on today's reef tanks and why so many reefers find themselves struggling to maintain a thriving reef tank and we have a higher rate of coral mortality than we did five or six years ago. I'd also rate it 1 to 10 on internal aesthetics like color presentation and options, shimmer, contrast and depth, and features and controllability as well as rated on external aesthetics in my home like perception of build quality or cosmetic appeal, profile or size based on your preference between fixtures or modules, related mounting options, and number of exposed cords and ballasts. Lastly, make a value judgment call based on the above and price. Some of you might prefer to evaluate it based on today's out-the-door cost of a working fixture with accessories. The more cost-conscious of you might like to take a five-year look at the total cost of ownership, including things like power and bulb consumption. I personally wouldn't go beyond five years because by then there's a good chance that you'll want to or need to replace it. Once you're done, add up your scores and the chances are the choice will almost certainly become clear. Feel free to adjust this as needed as well. Many people don't care what it looks like externally because it's mounted in a hood or in a fish room. Warranty and easy access to support where it's made like in the USA, Germany or China might be a big deal to you. 
With the BRS-160, we're shooting for a complete lighting solution as close as we can get to tens across the board, which is likely impossible, but I think it'll be really interesting to see what we ultimately select. Next week, we're gonna dive into T5 lighting, share everything we know about it from the past, why the hobby gravitated away from it in the last five years or so, and why there's been a recent surge of reefers reincorporating T5 lighting back into their lighting solutions and the results they're having. We'll also include a couple of direct examples from the BRS offices as well. I think this is gonna be super interesting, so make sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you value this type of information, let us know by hitting that thumbs up. See you next week with week 19, the Beerus 160 T5 lighting.